Hey everyone and welcome back. So I titled today's video, The 10 Biggest Mistakes Made by Hunters. Now that's pretty general, pretty generic. Uh, really the truth is these are the 10 biggest mistakes I've ever made on hunts. And I know there are probably many more, right? If you talk to different hunters, they're gonna tell you, oh, these are the biggest mistakes, these ones. Well, these are the biggest mistakes I've made and these are the mistakes that have cost me um, harvests, right? I, I didn't end up harvesting an animal uh, or I hit an animal and it, I didn't recover it, and different things like that. So um, these are the 10 biggest mistakes I've ever made on hunts and I'm going to go over this and I'm gonna be vulnerable here and embarrass myself because I wanna help you avoid these mistakes. So let's get into it and talk about the 10 biggest mistakes I've ever made on my hunts and how to avoid them. Okay, so the first one, going into a hunt with a weapon that you don't know. And believe me, I thought I, I, thought I had learned this lesson. <laughs> Apparently I had to relearn it and it was very painful. So probably about, let's see, I don't know, four or five years ago, I started um, accumulating points in other states outside of New Mexico because drawing hunts here has just become increasingly more difficult through our lottery system. So I thought I'm gonna increase my odds to be able to go hunting every year and I'm gonna start applying out of state. So I accumulated enough points in Wyoming for, for an antelope hunt, a buck antelope hunt, actually in either sex, antelope hunt. And I went and spent time, spent like four days in a blind with my bow and never had an opportunity to shoot a buck. So there were does coming in, but I just thought, man, I'm coming all the way to, all the way to Wyoming, I wanna shoot a buck. I held out, a buck never came to drink, so I could never shoot, shoot a buck. I went back in the rifle season, so now this is like the sixth day, right, that I've spent in Wyoming, not including travel. And I met a, a guy up there who knows the area well, and I had my own rifle, but he said, hey, um, I, I just got this rifle and I've sighted it in to a thousand yards. I have my dope, my dope sheet, you know, my dope chart, whatever you call it, dope card. Um, and I've got it ready to go out to a thousand yards. He goes, you should use this one. And most of you already know where I'm going with this. Basically, it was a massive mistake. I decided to use his rifle. I have never shot it. I, I have never even held this, this, this rifle, this weapon. And I, I shot at four bucks before realizing something was off with this rifle. First, I thought it was me. And I'm like, oh, I just missed. And then I missed again. Um, I've never missed twice on a hunt, ever. And then I missed, uh, well, two different animals, should I say, on a hunt. And then I missed a third antelope. On the third antelope, I noticed that the bullet was hitting really high. And I thought, gosh, am I pulling that hard? Well, it took a fourth, a fourth antelope for me to miss. And this time the antelope was situated kind of like let's say the antelope was here there was a hill behind it and my 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 bullet hit the windage was perfect right but the bullet hit literally like two feet above where I was aiming and I looked at him and I said dude something is wrong with this rifle I said this isn't me so he's like he swore up and down oh no I just did I just sighted and so we went and I said okay well you shoot it so we pulled over I let him and he he shot it and he was shooting at a bush sure enough he was two feet high and what we ended up figuring out was he had fully rotated his turret, his uh, elevation turret, one revolution. And so, you know, if we were shooting for 400, the rifle was shooting for, I don't know, 800, 7, 800 yards. That's why we were so high. So anyways, the point is I used a rifle that I was not familiar with. Um, I already knew better and it cost me a harvest. It costed, it cost me a harvested animal. After that, I didn't trust that rifle. My confidence was super low. That's something that missing will do on a hunt for you, right? Cause then you're questioning everything. Like, oh my, am I pulling? What am I doing? Am I, is my body correct? You start overthinking everything. My confidence was shot. I took one shot with my rifle and it was dead on. But as I shot, the antelope stood up and it hit right where I was aiming, but it was low, right? Because he stood up. And that was the last antelope I shot at on that hunt. So it cost me, you know, it took me two years to accumulate points there. Um, and it cost me, you know, all the travel, the money I put into that hunt. And then I didn't bring an antelope home. 
So I'm telling you, to this day, that one still hurts me pretty good. <laughs> I didn't know if I wanted to share that story, but I'm sharing it because I want to save you that pain. So do not hunt with a weapon that you have not practiced with yourself. I don't care how, I don't care if you're going with a, with a former, uh, you know, American sniper. Um, it doesn't matter. You have need, needed to have shot that rifle and practice with that rifle that you're going to be hunting with or the bow or whatever you're going to be shooting. Don't take anybody's word for it. And at the end of the day, I'm not going to blame my buddy in, in Wyoming that I met up with on that. That's on me because I know better, um, even though it is his kind of his fault too. <laughs> All right, let's get into number two. Not knowing the laws of the land. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically let me give you an example. In New Mexico and in other states, there are something, there's a piece, chunks of land called state land, right? And I thought I knew the rules going into, into a hunt. It wasn't even my hunt, actually. I was hunting with my brother-in-law. We parked about 100 feet off of the state, off the road, and we went into state land. We came back, and there was a ranger waiting for us at his truck, and he said, why did you guys park off the road? And we are like, just because we parked in, we wanted to be a little closer. You know, we, we, didn't, we didn't know we were breaking the law. Basically, we were breaking the law. We didn't know it. In New Mexico, you cannot park on state land. You have to park right off the, off the road or the highway, and then you need to walk in. Um, we didn't know that. This ranger was, uh, to put it nicely, um, pretty much a jerk and cited us for it. And he made us go to court in northeastern New Mexico. I had to drive from Albuquerque to northeastern New Mexico three times for this ticket. We had to stand before a judge and it was ridiculous, right? So it was a hard lesson learned, but know the laws of the land. Are you hunting private land? Are you hunting public? Are you hunting BLM, national forest, state land? What are you hunting and what are the rules? Where can you camp? Where can you park? Can you take an ATV in? Can you drive off road? All these things matter. And some of these rangers, they will, they will bust you, you know, for this and and the one that we happened to run into was was not feeling merc you know, gracious that day. And he hammered us. So know the laws of the land. That's number two. Let's get into number three. Guessing at yardage. This rarely is if ever works. Um, and I have so many stories of this, right? But I mean, I've been on rifle hunts where, you know, the shooter could have sworn it was, you know, that buck was 200 yards and the buck was 350 yards. Well, your bullet drop is gonna change. It's, it's gonna drop quite a bit from two to 350, depending on what you're shooting. So if you think he's at two and you shoot, you shoot for two, but he's at 350, you're gonna be way low, right? And I've seen that, I've seen that so many times that I've never really had to make that mistake. I carry a rangefinder on me, and we will not, I won't shoot if I don't know exactly how far that animal is, unless it's, you're hunting with a rifle and he's obviously he's 30 yards in front of you that's that's different right but um but if you're going to take a longer shot 200 above 200 yards you need to know the range of that animal and you need to know where your bullet's going to hit and that comes with practice right again you need to spend time with your weapon um and this is especially true for bow i will definitely not shoot um an animal with my bow if i don't know how far it is and i know some hunters that are pretty good at guessing range I'm not one of them. Um, I'm just be straight up with you. I've, I've tried that even here in my, my home range. I've tried, okay, how far? I put a, put a target, walk and turn around. Okay, 35 and, and I'm low. I was low because it was five yards longer or shorter, whatever it might've been. Number four, shooting at a moving animal. And for this one, I'm gonna use an example. Once again, something of my own. I can further embarrass myself here. But I was on a archery antelope hunt, an archery antelope hunt in New Mexico. This was actually my first archery hunt ever. I drew an archery antelope hunt for my first archery hunt. That was, that was tough. Um, and after five days of trying to learn how to get close enough for an archery kill on these an on pronghorn, I did it. I, I was able to weave. I found some cover. I was able to weave through some trees to get to where this buck was. And I was at 32 yards. I arranged him. He was walking. He had no idea I was there. I was behind a tree a big pine and I ranged him 32 yards. I drew back and he's walking, he's walking and I let my arrow go. He heard my release and you don't think 32 yards is that far, but with an arrow, these antelope are super fast and they have a chance, they have time to react and he reacted. Remember his momentum's already going forward. 
he 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 heard the arrow he heard the release and bolted forward and my arrow went exactly where i wanted it to go but it completely missed the antelope because he was he was on in a full sprint so a couple different things there i could have stopped him i could have tried to stop him right and you'll see people grunt at him or or whistle or do something to try to get their attention so they stop and for that split second you have a stopped animal and you can you can put your arrow where it needs to be um but basically i didn't stop him he wasn't stopped and i took a shot and poor judgment i learned you know don't shoot at a moving animal i wouldn't i won't even shoot at a moving animal moving animal with a rifle um i've tried it and i mean you're Sometimes if you're tracking, you know, if you're really on your rifle and you're tracking, sometimes you can make a pretty good shot. <clears throat> but it only takes a couple of, of blown opportunities to, to know that most of the time that's not going to work, you know. So wait for the animal to stop or try to stop the animal uh, before you take your shot. And that's going to give you more harvests, guaranteed. Number five, pushing a wounded animal. Another archery hunt of mine. Uh, another mistake I can share with you of mine. So I drew a northern New Mexico archery uh, mule deer hunt. Really good hunt, lots of deer. Uh, the year I went, there weren't any, I never ran into any big bucks. Um, so finally on day five, I finally just said, you know what, I'm going to shoot a meat buck. And and that was hard too. I say a meat buck like if it was easy. It was not. That that hunt was extremely difficult. But anyways, I, I pulled it off. Me and my my brother, my brother Mike was there with me on that particular day. Um, I shot, I pulled back, it was a 60 yard shot, but the mule, but he was stopped, he was broadside, I felt comfortable, I had been shooting out to 100, 110 yards, felt good uh, about penetration on it, so I let it go, I hit him perfectly, it was just awesome, um, I lunged him on one side and it came out kind of a little bit far back on the other side just because he was slightly quartering to me, I thought he was completely broadside, he was slightly quartering, um, he takes off. And this is my first archery kill, especially mule deer, spot and stock, very difficult. After five days, I was like elate. I was excited, right? So he takes off one. I start, I'm like screaming, like shouting victoriously. That was not good because you're freaking the animal out, right? Um, so you're kind of pushing the animal already. And, and then because I knew I hit him good, I told my brother, I said, hey, you know, neither of us had ever harvested with a bow. We sat, on, we, we sat where I had shot him for about 10, 15 minutes, and then I thought, he's ready, let's go get him. Bad mistake. We were walking in, and I do have footage of this. Let me show you this footage. We're walking, we're following a thick blood trail. I mean, this, this deer was definitely going to die. And then all of a sudden, the blood trail was gone. And I think basically the way I feel what had happened was he was, was going to lay down and die at the last spot we had found that blood. And because we went in after him and started stalking him to, to find him, he wasn't dead. He heard us, got up, and started pushing away. And what should have been a pretty easy find it turned into like a three-hour search for this mule deer. And I tell you right now, I never thought we would find it. We ended up finding this mule deer about half a mile from where I shot him. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but when you're in the forest, that's a, it's a waste, you know? And then how we... It was like a complete miracle. I was just like thanking God, like how did we find this mule deer? Um, we ended up finding him, but it could have it could have turned the other way. You know, it could have been that we didn't find him and didn't recover him. And it was simply because we pushed him. You know, so when you shoot an animal, if you're not sure of the shot or you don't see it go down, you need to give it time. You need to give it time to die. And so a lot of times it might take a little longer if you're hunting with a bow versus if you're hunting with a rifle. A lot of times you might you might see that, you know, shoot with a rifle, you might see your animal drop right in front of your eyes or, you know, 10 yards away or 15 yards away, you hit him good. With a bow, I mean, maybe that may not be the case, you know, unless you hit it right in the heart. So I've seen animals run double lunged. I, you know, I double lunged my first buck, muzzleloader buck, um, and he ran about 100 yards with with holes in his lungs before he went down. These animals are tougher than we think, I'm telling you. It's, it's amazing, really, how tough these animals are. All right, number six, foregoing a perfect opportunity for a follow shot, so not making a follow-up shot, a follow-up shot. This one haunts me deeply because I've lost two bull elk because of this. So 
the first bull elk I ever shot, I ever hit with my bow, um, I made a poor shot. I'm just be straight up. I made a poor shot. I was so, the moment was so overwhelming. When you have a bull, you finally have that, it's all, everything comes together. You finally have a bull on public land, broadside. He's looking at you. The shot was a little far. Um, and I, the strangest thing, I, I didn't, this is going to sound so weird, but I didn't think, I just lost my mind. I didn't aim correctly. I didn't put my pin on the, on the, on the, on the front, you know, on the lungs of the heart, like I should have. It was on his stomach and I just let it go. I don't have an explanation for you, except I was overwhelmed by the moment I was taken up. I made a bad shot, but it hit him and I saw him go like that. And then he started walking sick and I said, oh, this, this, Alex going down. He wasn't going down. He walked up a little hill and he stood there for like 10, 15 minutes. He wasn't looking my way and I could have made my way to him and hit him a second time and I didn't do it. And just a painful lesson. I should have put another arrow into that elk and I didn't. And we never found him. We went back the next day. We looked all day long between three of us um, and we did not find that bull. And that was losing my first bull Oh my God, I don't know how to explain that feeling. If, if you haven't had that happen to you yet, it's kind of hard to explain it, but incredibly painful and depressing, especially during a hunt. It's hard to recollect yourself, collect yourself after that. And the second bull I shot, I made a fantastic shot. It was a totally different scenario. I double, I double lunged it. I could see clearly the blood was coming out of the other side of the animal. My arrow was sticking out of the elk about this much. I said, that elk's dead. He's done. Um, and once again, I could have shot twice and I didn't. I had a chance. He turned around. He went down a little hill. I could have walked up to that and shot him again there, probably 40, 50 yards. I didn't do it. I did follow him because I had learned from the first bull. Um, I don't want to lose this bull. You know, I want to, I want to try to track him without him realizing I'm there. And I did. I, I followed him about a hundred yards through the forest and I, I left him in this spot where I was sure he was gonna just die. So I backed out, that was another opportunity. I could have shot him probably at 25 yards and I didn't. And I'm telling you, I kicked myself for that. Um, elk are just way more tough than, than you could ever think. And sad to say, we recovered my arrow. A friend of mine found my arrow, but uh, we never found the bull. And I'm telling you right now, losing one bull is enough. Losing two, oh my gosh, um, embarrassing. To, I mean, it's it is it's embarrassing, you know. Um, and it's and it's it wouldn't be embarrassing if I if I if you learn from your lessons and you because it's hard, right? Hunting's hard. Hunting is is freaking hard, um, especially certain species and in certain um, land. Elk, public land elk, uh, with a bow in New Mexico. You know, it, it takes time to learn that. And we've we've learned the hard way and it's tough. Um, so all that story, that, that embarrassing story, um, take a follow-up shot if you have one, you know. And if he hasn't gone down, put another arrow in him, you know. And, you know, you're not trying to ruin me, you know, keep lunging him or hit him in the heart. But, you know, they're they're tougher than you think. And if you can put another arrow in him, or another bullet, you may have to, and you have the chance, do it. And you'll be you'll be harvesting more animals that way for sure. Number seven is dehydration. Oh, do I got a story for you on this one. So I'm on a off-range oryx hunt, and I didn't get their permission to share their names, uh, but a family member of mine and a close friend. <laughs> And the off-range hunt is, is intense. It's a tough hunt, right? Because if you ever looked at the Oryx hunts in New Mexico, there's the on-range, the white sand missile range hunt. That's a once in a lifetime. They're everywhere, right? Pretty much. And it's, it's like a 98% success rate or something. I don't know. It's really high, 90 plus 90%. The off-range hunt is different. This is where the animals, um, they're coming out of the range and they're kind of touching on the areas outside of White Sands Missile Range on the public land, state land, national forest. So they're harder to find, right? And um, on this particular hunt, the shooter um, ended up shooting an RX about a mile from the truck. 
and then and and didn't make a kill shot on the first shot and continue to follow this oryx this oryx for two more miles from the truck and these off-range hunts happen all year so this was august and it was 96 degrees so i get a call because i told him if you get one down let me know where he was hunting is only like an hour from my house so i told him you get one i'll go help you guys get it out you know so he called me he's like dude he's like i got one down but we are in a bad situation we ran out of water it's only like 11 in the morning and it's already 96 degrees we ran out of water we do not have packs to to pack out the animal and um we're three miles from the truck and he's like dude we need help so all of a sudden you know i i, I took water and I had to, I parked as close as I could to where they were at. Unfortunately, you can't drive into this area, you know? So it was, it, when I, by the time I got there, you know, it was figure one o'clock. Um, they'd already been out there. They had started working on, on, um, quartering the animal, but they were so hot and dehydrated that they had to stop. So by the time I got to them, it took me, this isn't going to sound too bad. It took me, but it took me 90 minutes to get to them from the truck walking. And I'm, I'm I walk fast. I mean, I'm a runner, right? I've done marathons, ultra marathons. And when I tell you I'm walking, I was walking briskly. I mean, I'm walking, I got water, I got a pack, but I'm, I'm moving. It took me 90 minutes just to get to them with nothing. So by the time I got there, I could not believe how far they were. And this terrain, it's desert, right? You got cactus, you have rattlesnakes, you have yuccas giant bushes. You can't walk a straight path. You're walking up and down hills. It looks flat, but it's not. So needless to say, they were dehydrated. They didn't have the proper stuff to get the Oryx out. So I threw the, the head of the Oryx and a quarter on my back, which was heavy, um, really heavy, heavier than I thought it was going to be. And I had to debone the meat there for them because they had small backpacks. They didn't have packs to carry out quarters. And they had cut off the bottom half of the leg so they couldn't even use the tendon, you know, or the hoof to put it over the shoulder and try to walk it out. So I deboned it. We deboned the meat. They put as much meat as they could in their packs and we started making our way back. And I made it back to the truck exhausted. Uh, it was three o'clock in the morning, but that point's probably hundred degrees. And I called them to see where they're at and they didn't answer. And I was freaking out. <laughs> This story is, it's a long story, um, but uh, they were basically so tired and dehydrated, they had uh, took shelter under a tree and fallen asleep. Sun's starting to get, now the sun's starting to set now, right? We're getting close, and I, they finally answered. I said, oh, where are you guys at? And they're like, dude, you know, we're, we are, we need more water. Can you, you need to come back. So I had to go back halfway with more water just to get them out. At this point, getting the meat out was second priority. Like it was turning into a survival situation. And it was all because they were dehydrated. They didn't have enough water and they weren't, they, they weren't able to remember how far they were from the truck by the time they got that, they got the animal down. So this is a lesson in dehydration. And there's a lot of lessons in this one. We ended up getting out. Everyone was safe, but dehydrated. And I'm talking like where your body, like you can't pee dehydrated. Like it was bad. It was really bad. But we got out, we got most of the meat out. Um, some of it didn't make it out just because of the situation, you know, but carry water on you, carry enough water, um, you know, and, and be aware of where you're at on your hunt. You know, they weren't lost. They knew where they were, but they had, for, they had lost track of how far they were from the truck. And it ended up costing us some meat and potentially could have turned into a situation where we needed to get them to a hospital because they were they were dehydrated. So don't let that happen to you. You know, carry enough water. Um, and if you don't have enough water to, to keep following an animal um, and make it back, you need to turn back to your truck because you could die. You could totally die out there. And that almost happened. So Number eight, being unprepared to pack out an animal. I just, I was just telling you that I got there and they didn't have, they didn't have packs. They didn't have frame packs. So, I mean, it was like, I looked at them and I was like, well, how do you guys plan to get the, your, you know, meat out? And I mean, again, it was just, it was a bad situation all around. I'm not picking on them. Um, 
because uh, one of them, I mean, I respect them both. They're they're both successful hunters. It was just it turned into one of those things where it just it just happened. Sometimes you just do stuff on a hunt, and you almost can't even explain why you did it. You know, you're in the moment, you get excited, and you forget about things that you usually wouldn't. You know, um, but this isn't to this isn't to dog them out at all because God knows we've all made some bad mistakes on hunts, right? But, um, but yeah, the pack thing, make sure, you know, you go into a hunt thinking I'm going to harvest an animal. Okay. Once that happens, what do I got? What do I need? Well, if you're out two miles from the truck, you're going to need something to carry the meat back to your truck. So you're going to need to invest in a frame pack or at least a pack that can carry full quarters of, of elk, <clears throat> deer, oryx, antelope, whatever you're, whatever you're hunting. Right. So be prepared, bring the gear you need. Number nine is getting lost. Don't get lost. If you do get lost, don't freak out. Keep your mind about you. Uh, a friend of mine, old friend of the family, told me a story of, of a hunt they were on before I was, long before I was even born, where this hunter, it was, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. He's like, hey, I'm going to go out for the evening hunt. He told the guys, I'm going to go by myself this time. He went out for the evening hunt and never came back that night. And they knew something was wrong because he he was not prepared to, to go spend a night in the wilderness by himself. He left with a rifle and I don't even know if he had water on him. So all of a sudden the whole camp, you know, it's night now. They, they get up and we're like, we got to go find him. They had to go find him. And I don't know how long it took them, but then he eventually found this dude. He was naked. He had thrown his rifle into the wilderness. I don't even know if they ever found it. He had no water on him. He was freezing. And he was incoherent. He was free, he freaked out. He totally freaked out. Um, and that's scary stuff, right? I don't know if you've ever spent a night alone in the wilderness. Even with a with a sound mind, sometimes it can be it can be a little scary, you know. Um, but if you lose your wits, if you lose your mind about you when you're out there and you're lost, you don't have water, you enough to throw your the only protection you have out, a weapon, he threw his rifle. That's bad. You know, that's a bad situation. And they, he was extremely fortunate that they found him. And I think the way they had found him is he had shot, he had let off three shots before he chucked his rifle. He shot three times and they heard it faintly. And that was, that was their only way of, hey, let's go this way. And hopefully we found him. And they did. They found him stripped down and without water and a weapon. And who knows if that dude would have even have survived the night had they not found him. So be prepared um, to know that you may get turned around. And what are you going to do if you get turned around? You got to, you know, stay calm. And, you know, you got to stay, you got to think with, you got to think, but make sure you have water on you. Make sure you have fire starter. You know, there are certain things you need to survive a night in the wilderness. And then the next day, hopefully find a road or somewhere back, you know, so you can get back to camp, but you can save your life, you know. So try to avoid getting lost, but if you do, don't freak out. Be prepared for it. Have enough stuff on you to get you back to camp, to get you back to safety. And the last one, number 10, is just physical fitness. You know, are you physically fit to, to hunt the animal that you're hunting? And this is a little bit of a, of a low blow to the whitetail hunters, you know, but we, me and my daughter did our first whitetail hunting um, last year. Uh, the way the whitetail hunting, you know, where people sit in stands. And so honestly, to do that, physical fitness really isn't even required you know you people who um are you know in wheelchairs could do hunts like that you know sit in a blind and wait for a deer to come and and then when you get your deer down you know typically you know you're hunting private property and you can drive your truck right up to your buck <laughs> so it's really not a big deal to get an animal out um but if you're used to that and then you come to new mexico you can't drive in there and you you harvest an elk or you harvest an antelope you know two miles from your truck and you got to pack that meat out it's i mean it's it's work you know and if you're not prepared to do that if you're not prepared to hunt the animal um you're really diminishing your chances of enjoying the hunt but also harvesting an animal right if you're not physically prepared so i don't i don't want to harp on that too much but just keep that in mind am i physically fit to hunt elk on public land this year um, or are you just going to be hunting are you going to be sitting a blind you know where you don't have to do a lot of that um, they're different uh, on a physical level the, the fitness required for them it's, it's two different things so just keep that in mind those are the 10 
biggest mistakes I have personally either committed myself or have seen someone commit with my own eyes on a hunt. I hope that me sharing this and me, you know, being honest with you with this, um, I hope it helps you. I hope it saves you, you know, pain and <laughs> and loss, you know, of opportunities on your hunts uh, because it has cost me for sure uh, several animals of my own. So again, if that did help you, please like this video, share it, and subscribe to my channel. And I will see you next time uh, with more tips for your hunts. Take care.